Hello and welcome to YHTV's nominated show, Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 95. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Wolman. Hello, Dr. Wolman. Hello, Miss Christina. How Good, are you? Great on this hot, sunny day. It's beautiful. It's it's uh, spring. Was it spring yet? You know, it feels like summer right now. It's 91 degrees. I know. <laughs> in it spring. Was, it was spring in February. Oh, it's crazy, isn't it? Oy. Okay. Well, parts of it I love. <laughs> yes, yes. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman, and I will be your guide along with Christina today as we search another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy in our quest for optimal health. Uh, we're very excited again today. We have with us Kabir Southwick. Many of you now know him. He's been a frequent guest on our show. He is an Ayurvedic practitioner. He's an author. He's a formulator of herbs and medications. Uh, he's a lecturer. Does so many things. I recommend that all of you go back and look at all of his shows because it seems like each show that we do uh, changes people a little bit in terms of their way of thinking of foods and diet and uh, lifestyle. And today we're going to be talking about, uh, our title is Spring Cleaning, Spring Detoxification. And detoxification is a very important part of the Ayurvedic practice. And we're going to learn uh, Kabir's uh, Ayurvedic method of detoxification. But before that, uh, any business we have to deal with, Christina? Well, of course, if uh, any of you have a question or a comment, simply scroll down on your screen and type it into the comment box. Now, you're very, very welcome to call us directly at 818-LET'S-TALK, 818-LET'S-TALK, and be sure to leave your contact information so we can get back to you. And we promise that we will deliver your question or comment over to uh, our special guest, Kabir Southwick, or to Dr. Bowman. Thank you, Glenn. No, oh, you're quite welcome. So I would like to introduce and welcome back to our show, Kabir Southwick. Greetings, Kabir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Glenn and uh, Christina, for having me again. It's my pleasure. Oh, uh, it's surely our pleasure, too. <laughs> I want to learn how to spring clean right. <laughs> <laughs> Have your anima bag ready there? <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to reach for yours. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I remember when I was a kid, there was a uh, show on television where, uh, and this is dating me a little bit, but it was called Winky Dink. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a show where you would buy a, a plastic screen that you would put over your television and you had these crayons. And sometimes, you know, you would, they would tell you, take out your red crayon and quick, Winky's in trouble. He's trying to escape from somebody and you would, it'd be on a cliff and you would take the red crayon and and follow a dotted line on the TV and draw it as if it were a bridge to get him aside. Wow, so, that's very cool. It was very cool, but I was just thinking as you brought up, I have my bag ready. We should start getting people to prepare themselves for each show, telling them the instruments and implements <laughs> that they need. <laughs> and Kabir will demonstrate how to use the enema properly. <laughs> In the eye. Ayurvedic fashion. <laughs> you're, sure, scaring, get some... you're scaring him, Glenn. He yeah. This might be his last show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if that would get you more traffic or less traffic on YouTube. <laughs> well, it's worth testing. We're seeing all the reality shows getting a lot of traffic. So what could be, what could be more real than an enema? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so we're going to talk about toxins today and detoxification. And I wanted to just open this uh, a little bit with maybe a definition. If people that watch our show all the time may remember episode 11 uh, with Gary Winston, uh, Dr. Winston, who talks about toxins and toxicants. And he, he defined a toxin as a poisonous substance usually produced within living cells or organisms versus toxicants, which are things that we synthetically uh, produce. But both are poisonous and both are toxic to our bodies. We're exposed all the time to toxins. There, there are at least 80,000 or more toxins that uh, the FDA and many of the scientists look at to determine whether they're safe or not. Uh, and there are many more out there. 
But basically, we're being exposed all the time to toxins, and our body does an amazing job uh, getting rid of them. Toxins come into the body usually in a number of ways, either through the mouth by things that we eat, uh, through the breathing system, our nose and mouth. Uh, it, it can be uh, brought in through the skin, absorbed through the skin, and uh, maybe even through other parts, maybe sometimes through the eye or obviously through a bite or an injection of sorts. And the body deals with toxins really beautifully, and I think that's what we're going to be talking about today, to how to keep the body uh, functioning perfectly to take care of its own detoxification methods. Usually the way toxins are eliminated are through the feces, through urine, um, and through sweat, and through the breath. But before they get eliminated, they come into the body and they have to be uh, taken care of. And the strongest organ that takes care of them is the liver. It's an amazing organ. I think I've talked about this before, but we had a lecture on the liver uh, once during medical school. Uh, it, has, it does over 500 or more types of metabolic changes, including detoxifications. And after the lecture, it was so impressive to everyone. We gave the liver a standing ovation. It was, it was quite amazing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but there are many parts of the body that work on detoxifying, and we're going to get into a little bit of that. But I want to start with uh, talking to Kabir about first your concept of what, what a toxin is from the Ayurvedic point of view. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Glenn. I, I think it's important to say that my views are not strictly um, uh, based on only Ayurvedic uh, practices, since I do incorporate uh, some techniques and uh, herbal formulas, which are not uh, usually used in Ayurveda, um, and many naturopathic uh, approaches that were developed here in the West through those such as Dr. Christopher and and others. So I, I do want to say that up front, this is not a purely uh, a, a lesson in Ayurvedic detoxification or panchakarma, but more a sharing of my experience and knowledge where I've combined some naturopathic uh, approaches um, based on Ayurvedic principles and, of course, have integrated a lot of Western herbs um, into uh, my treatments because of uh, you know, my knowledge of them. But uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your, that. I wanted to say that up front. But to answer your question about toxins, I think that was a great introduction you said there. I just want to add a little bit more to it besides just the environmental toxins, which we are, of course, so familiar with that have been produced since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of uh, chemicals and uh, uh, particularly pesticides in our foods, but uh, also those that have been added to the atmosphere and our, our water, of course, have increased our. Uh, a toxic burden, we should say, to a much higher degree um, than is ever recorded in history. And that's why I, I still uh, use a lot of uh, more what we could call Western naturopathic uh, detoxification procedures, because I believe that uh, during the time of Ayurveda, they never really had such high toxic levels as we do. Just taking pharmaceutical medications, for example, can be a great burden for both the kidneys and the liver, and in Ayurveda, they had no uh, experience with this. And now, of course, this is something we have to face. And uh, many naturopathic treatments are much shorter, much more direct, and focused on particular organs. So I think in many cases, they are more suitable for our, our Western uh, uh, health conditions than the more slower and deeper and uh, more a diet-focused uh, uh, treatments of uh, uh, in Ayurveda. But I do combine them, and that's what I'll be covering. But uh, I wanted to also cover not just environmental toxins, which we're all very familiar with, uh, that we both have mentioned, but also uh, toxins that are created by the body itself. Because in a, in a sense, we are all creating toxins on a daily basis, and this is what's often overlooked. Uh, the best example of this is undigested food. When you eat, say, for example, late at night, this food isn't digested because the, the body doesn't really have sufficient time because it has to focus on 
other metabolic processes taking place during the sleep based on the circadian cycles of the body. So this, in a sense, becomes this undigested food uh, becomes toxic. In Ayurveda, this is ama or congestion. Um, and this is uh, made not due to environmental factors, but due to our own um, irregular eating habits or poor eating habits, including late night eating. Also, other uh, uh, pathogens we could include in as toxins, uh, particularly uh, parasites such as worms, of course, uh, prevalent in the third world and much more prevalent here in uh, Western society than um, is often first uh, acknowledged. So uh, these would also consider to be toxins. Uh, gall stones, uh, um, kidney stones are a type of congestion, but basically anything that is not a healthy or supportive of the body w- uh, that the body would want to eliminate through its five eliminating channels, the uh, colon, the kidneys, uh, liver, skin, and uh, the respiratory system, as you mentioned. Any of these uh, uh, substances, whether it's a pathogen or environmental toxin or a chemical or an accumulation of uh, a particular mineral, in the case of kidney stones, these would all be considered uh, uh, toxic uh, to the body, uh, harmful um, if they were accumulated uh, to an uh, excessive degree and not eliminated uh, properly. So I think first it's important to uh, broaden our understanding of what is toxins. Often a bloated belly with uh, uh, excessive uh, 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 swelling can be signs of liver toxicity. Even excessive body fat can be uh, signs of toxicity. Many people with skin conditions that, uh, that haven't been able to remove uh, weight or lose weight, and they also have uh, chronic skin conditions, maybe psoriasis or eczema or something similar, Um, often uh, have high toxicity levels, even uh, high metal toxicity levels, which is burned in the liver and and the kidneys. And now these toxins have started to store in the fat tissue, which has less circulation and is uh, actually safeguarding the body from excessive toxin uh, overload. So even toxins can be stored in our fat, uh, in the skin, and uh, learning how to eliminate them um, uh, is, is really a very, very important in our modern society. And in Ayurveda, detoxification is a critical aspect of uh, uh, healthcare. I would say that uh, that is excellent. And in keeping with our program, before we get into how we eliminate, I just want to mention that what, what toxins do and we always talk about a cellular level of things, I always bring things to a cellular level, is that the cells are made up of uh, proteins and fats and are using carbohydrates to create their energy and perform their functions. When these toxins get into the body, into the fat portions of a cell or, or affecting the proteins in the cell, <clears throat> it doesn't allow the cell to do what it normally does And therefore, that's when we have failures. You talk about kidney failure, liver failure, respiratory failure, heart failure. The body starts breaking down. So it's very important to understand what these toxins do and that the body and primarily the liver most of the time detoxifies it through a number of different methods. And sometimes the the blood that is carrying these toxins goes through the liver sometimes up to two quarts a minute are going through the liver, two quarts of blood per minute, are going through the liver to detoxify these substances. And it does it in a number of different ways. It can make it fat-soluble. The liver can add other chemicals to it to change its formula and therefore making it more susceptible to be eliminated through the other systems that we both have suggested, the feces, the urine, uh, the breath. But before we get into elimination, Kabir, I want to talk mm-hmm. a little about 
how to prevent the toxins from coming in. You know, you talked about how we produce our own waste products, and clearly that's true, and we're not going to prevent that. But there are many things around us that are toxic that the first step, I think, always for our way of taking care of people is prevention. What do you do in terms of prevention? Oh, that's uh, very important. Uh, but the first step really is to improve digestion um, and uh, in making in improving eating habits and having digestion strong so we're not accumulating more uh, toxins in our own GI tract, particularly our, our colon, um, our large intestines on a daily basis. I would say this is the, the first step and often ignored in people doing detoxification programs that de digestion has to be quite uh, robust with healthy elimination. Uh, secondly, of course, is all of our exposure that we have on a, a daily basis. This is why, you know, organic foods are so important um, to, to be consuming uh, locally grown um, is, is even preferred. And uh, often ignored is uh, cleaning products. Uh, these cleaning products that are used to clean our clothes, um, clean our dishes, um, um, are often a, a much larger source of our, our daily chemical exposure than we realize. Uh, I use uh, um, air filters in every single room in my house, um, and these are cleaning out um, to some degree some uh, pathogens in, in the air and keeping the air uh, lower with lower dust and and uh, preventing upper respiratory issues and congestion. I think this is important, often ignored using air filters. Um, and of course, uh, uh, water filters um, are very important. I'm an advocate of simple water filtration using charcoal. I'm a big advocate of charcoal use for upholsteries and other detoxification methods, but uh, particularly filtration of water. I get my water from a spring or a well here up in the mountains in Ojai, and then I filter it again through uh, charcoal. Um, if your initial source of water isn't as good, then um, you, know, you may need more stronger filtration than charcoal. But it's important to think of the air we breathe with water filters. Um, the uh, water air, we drink. Air filters with air yes, filters. Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> air filters with air filters. Water with uh, uh, water filters. And, um, and then, of course, the uh, food that we use every day. And um, any type of product that we put on our skin, it's amazing to me, people with uh, skin conditions, even just uh, acne, uh, tend to be using uh, synthetic clothes washed in, in chemical detergents and uh, you use makeup or skincare products um, with high uh, amount of chemicals. So using natural products to clean your skin. Uh, you know, uh, and using oils and long ways it, over a period of time to avoid uh, a toxic buildup. And like you said, Glenn, the body is continually detoxifying 24-7, uh, particularly at night. The body has a lot of detoxification processes it goes through um, each and every night. So I believe our body can deal with... Uh, uh, pr probably more toxins than we acknowledge, but at the same time, I think in our modern age, the amount of uh, environmental toxins that we're exposed to is much higher uh, le level than the body can uh, manage on a daily basis. So what detoxification is about is not just removing high con concentrations of toxins in different systems, whether it's the lymphatic system, fat cells, liver, or kidney, or colon, but uh, also just helping to open up these eliminating channels and continue supporting detoxification on a daily basis. I like all the things that you said, talking about uh, improving the air, improving the water, eating the better foods, and using better products. And I would suggest that everybody after this show or after listening or watching, go to your uh, kitchen cabinet and look at all of the products that you use to clean glass, to clean the stove, to clean the dishes, and make sure that you're using products that are healthy for you. You can even make up some of your own products. I'm sure you have some products that you've made up, things like vinegar and baking soda, uh, maybe, exactly. 
lemon and lime and things like that that sometimes do as good a job um, but don't cause the toxic buildup. And that's the key here. I think one of the important messages for today is our, our goal is to minimize the exposure to environmental toxins. And at the same time, what we're going to learn more about today is enhancing the body's own ability to detoxify. So I think with that concept there, um, although I will say, I must say that when you use some of these other things, sometimes your house, instead of smelling like the beautiful things that they put into all of these toxic uh, products, it may smell more like a salad. It smells <laughs> like a salad dressing sometimes with the vinegar, things like that. So l- let's talk about uh, detoxification in general. Give us a, an overall picture of what detoxification is, and then let's break it down into different parts. Yes. Well. Um... You know, most uh, people need to have their own detoxification protocol spelled out. If I I say anything to introduce detoxification to uh, patients or people who inquire about my services, and it is a a large part of what I do, um, and we could just we could say that detoxification is um, half of all therapies applied. One half being the nurturing and toning uh, therapies, which are nutritional, uh, dietary, digestive, where you're uh, nurturing and helping to provide the body with what it needs. And many people who are deficient um, in one way or another benefit from doing these nurturing and and toning treatments first, particularly for those who are weak or frail or very old or very young. So there's some cases where you don't want to start with detoxification, but you want to start with nurturing and and toning therapies first. But the other side of the coin is uh, of giving the body what it needs is to help the body to remove what it doesn't need. And this is the depleting and detoxifying, as we call them, therapies. And each person needs a different approach. <clears throat> and this is, a, I think, the biggest mistake made um, here um, in uh, the United States with the detoxification programs, such as three-day detox, five-day detox, seven-day detox, 10-day detox. All these are, are um, be ineffective in the least and, and harmful in the most because there's no dictating how long it's going to take to cleanse out a particular person's colon or their body. Um, so you can't go into a detoxification program with a fixed program. You need to adjust it for your own health state, your own level of detoxification needs, and uh, your own digestion. And many of the, much of this would be uh, uh, dictated by your, your bowel movements and your, your current state of elimination. And that's the easiest way to understand the differences in uh, approaching detoxification is even a person's uh, regularity. A person who has uh, dry and hard uh, stools and is, uh, has a tendency for constipation and not having a bowel movement every three or four days would start a detoxification or a purge of the colon uh, with a very different treatment than somebody who had regular bowel movements or loose bowel movements. Um, So just though that factor alone would dictate a different direction, different approach, different herbs, and different steps to begin to cleanse the colon. So I think this is an important thing to first understand about any detoxification program is it has to be adjusted for you and you can't read it out of a book and you can't just take a package program. You have to understand your own state, your own needs, and then start from there and uh, go a step at a time um, uh, to detoxify the body. And you really cannot detoxify the whole body at the same time. You can start to open up your elimination channels and improve, get the bowels moving and drink more liquids and and to flush the kidney bladder pathway and um, do some uh, uh, salt baths or sweating to open up the skin pores. But in, in fact, you really can only focus on 
uh, one, uh, Oregon or um, so the order in which you detoxify is very important too, and that may also vary from person to person. So I think the first thing is to sit back and understand your body or meet with a practitioner who can help you to plan out a detoxification a program over the next uh, 30 days that is uh, suitable for you and going step at a time addressing the organs and systems that uh, are important for you to uh, address based on your level of detoxification at the time. I like the way you uh, bring that up. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy these episodes is because you clearly look at each person individually rather than saying, okay, we need to put you on our special detox program and everybody is the same program. A group of people go to a spa and they're all eating this one food and they're all uh, fasting about with this or they're all taking this particular uh, juice or et cetera. <clears throat> and it, it, it isn't individualized and that's very important. So the first step, as you're saying, is to analyze and see what you need in your own program. What are the toxins you're exposed to and how are you eliminating them and then focus on that. It's very important to make sure that before somebody goes into a detoxification program that they are as healthy as possible, meaning probably uh, decrease stress, increase your exercise program, get good sleep, and do all the other things that we've said so far. I'm sure you agree with that, Kabir. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you, you can't really start a detoxification program if you're depleted, uh, ex uh, have chronic fatigue, uh, insomnia, uh, uh, you're underweight uh, or are frail or weak in any manner. You must strengthen the person up uh, first. And this is particularly true with those the, the vata uh, uh, body type, which is tends to have... Uh, a more a weaker constitution tends to be a little more uh, underweight and thinner. Um, the person who is a heavier and has uh, more body fat obviously is more suitable for uh, stronger detoxification therapies and is more suitable for uh, fasting. Uh, a, a vata person who's weak or frail or underweight or just not uh, capable of fasting, then you know fasting obviously would be counterindicative. Somebody who's able to go all day without eating meals and it doesn't mind fasting uh, and maybe doesn't like cooking and has a lot of extra body fat, maybe uh, very suitable for a couple days of fasting at the right time in a detoxification program. But fasting itself is not, not uh, detoxification by itself. And uh, even juicing is not uh, detoxification. This is another misunderstanding that we see in many programs where people are uh, doing juice fast. Not to say that juicing is not uh, beneficial, and many juices do help in detoxification. We know that these many of these roots like uh, beets and, and uh, carrots to a lesser degree uh, support the uh, uh, liver and uh, help uh, detoxification, detox the liver, or we should say help to the liver to better process toxins. But the problem with just juicing is that where is your elimination, as we both have mentioned? If you're only having juices, you're, you're not having a bowel movement, so you're not eliminating there. Um, and um, <clears throat> unless you're having a lot of liquids and some diuretics, you may not be urinating any more than usual if you're just having a certain amount of juices. So a juice can really support the body and help the body to process toxins, and to some, some of these juices can support either kidney or liver, but by themselves, a juice fast is by no means a detoxification. So I did want to make that point as well. Yeah, I like that. I'm glad you're making that point. I also want to state right here that I think that we need to be, instead of thinking about detoxification, although we labeled this spring detox, and we'll talk about that, um, a detoxification process, because we're continuously exposing ourselves to toxins, this has to be a lifestyle process. It's not something that you can just do once a year because you're accumulating toxins every day. Yeah. It has to be a whole lifestyle that you have to prepare for and be in optimal health for all along. 
Yeah, that's an- another great point there, Glenn. Um, the other- and often we wait until it's too late. We wait until we have the serious uh, health condition or the chronic health condition, and we've tried everything else, and then we turn to uh, detoxification, and we can hear many stories of people who have been very successful in turning their life around by uh, uh, detoxifying for extended periods of time. But in fact, it's better to make this a regular habit um, and be conducting some mild uh, detoxification all throughout the year, but particularly the spring. The spring is the natural time for the body to let go and to detoxify and rid itself of the congestion and the extra fat that it has accumulated during the winter months where the winter harvest of foods is uh, heavier, more oily, and um, our body in it had to, um, or naturally we could say, uh, had a tendency to put on more weight and, and have a little bit more congestion during the winter to protect us from the cold winter months and allow us to um, to survive with less food, so to speak. Uh, but in the spring, this is the time that uh, animals are naturally detoxing. The, the, they've, the squirrels have run out of nuts and started to uh, eat uh, little uh, sprouts uh, like they do in my garden. Uh, I've seen the, <laughs> the, the deer out there uh, pulling up roots and eating the little sprouts. And even my horse, I've seen my horse eating the dandelion uh, uh, not the roots, but the whole plant. And, and, and I, I think this is a natural tendency for animals to eat these young, bitter herbs um, uh, when they, in the springtime and cleanse out their colon naturally. So we should follow in the natural cycles. Um, and this is very important in Ayurveda. So spring is the, the best time for detoxification for, for all doshas. And the kapha needs the greatest amount of detoxification with the pitta in the middle and the vata the the least. All right. So we are now at the point where we're agreeing that we have toxins inside of us and a person recognizes through their stools and bloating and a number of things that they're feeling that they're toxic. And there could also be things that we haven't mentioned yet. Some of the things like the heavy metals that are out there, maybe mercury in the in your dental fillings or mercury in foods that we're eating and maybe t- too much lead in certain areas. So, so there are many of these things that are inside of us. And just to, just to give this a, a bigger picture, things are usually either fat-soluble meaning they can absorb into fat and stay in fat, like Kabir has mentioned, where they'll be stored in fat cells. Or they're water-soluble, which means they're stored in uh, a water type of solution in the body. The things that are water-soluble will usually be eliminated through the kidney. The things that are fat-soluble will usually be detoxified by the liver, including uh, the bile. It'll be brought into the small intestine and then into the large intestine and then eliminated that way. So the fat solubles usually go out through the intestine and the water soluble usually go out through the kidney. Kabir, when somebody comes to you now and says, I want to go through a detoxification process, what is your uh, program? Well, like I said, I try to plan it out based on their uh, health. And, uh, but generally we start with, uh, cleansing out the colon. Um, uh, it's only the degree in which a person needs, uh, cleansing of the colon. Uh, those who have a history or a tendency towards constipation obviously are going to need stronger purgatives and, uh, more time to, uh, uh, to cleanse out the colon. Anybody with a history of uh, diverticuli or, or other uh, colon issues may also require more time, and those who have regular bowel movements would uh, would receive more mild uh, herbs to uh, cleanse their colon. But it's uh, th- this being the major eliminating pathway, um, then this generally is the best place to start throughout the whole detoxification program, whether we're uh, focusing on the liver or the uh, skin and blood uh, or the kidneys, the bowels have to continue to to remain moving throughout the entire detoxification period. Uh, So 
it's very important initially to start off with um, uh, increasing the bowels. For those who have dry stools, we often start with oilation therapy where you're taking ghee for three days first, and this tends to um, eliminate the dryness uh, by taking tablespoons of ghee in the morning and increasing the amount uh, gradually for three or four days and uh, starts to soften the stools and uh, make the skin is evident in more uh, oily skin. And then at that point, this person can undergo a purge. Um, and a purge is, can be done in, it, with different herbs in different ways. For those who are dry, um, castor oil is a very, very effective, used in Ayurveda and also a very uh, traditional uh, Western uh, way to get the bowels moving right away. Many people in India give their children one teaspoon of castor oil once a month. It does taste terrible. You have to teach your kids to take it. Um, and for many people with dry, hard uh, stools and extreme constipation, um, a tablespoon or two of castor oil at night can um, clear the entire GI tract, for that matter. It's really considered a purge, so not just the colon, but the entire GI tract will uh, a flush uh, uh, somewhat uh, violently. That's what makes it a purge over just a laxative, um, and uh, or forcefully, we should say. And this is uh, sometimes necessary for some people, uh, the oilation first and then a purge to get things going. And then after that, uh, to maintain the uh, bowel movements with the right uh, formula of herbs. Again, um, to really to cleanse the body, herbs are necessary. A supplementation is uh, a, a nurturative type of therapy and is not going to support detoxification in many, uh, very much. And juicing, as I mentioned, is very limited. Um, and fasting can be a tool, but it has its limitations. So um, herbs really are the main tool for uh, allowing you to focus on different organs and to, in this case, to maintain your bowel movements throughout the detoxification period. So a vata person may re receive um, certain herbs that are stronger, like rhubarb or sienna or carsata sagrada to keep the bowels moving, moved, balanced, of course, with cardamative herbs like uh, coriander, fennel, licorice, um, and ginger to balance out the gripping uh, effects of some of those um, laxative herbs. Well, others may not eat, need any of those strong laxative herbs, just a mild tea of cardamom, cumin, ginger, um, and of, uh, fennel may be sufficient uh, to help a person to keep their bowels moving at night. So first is just to get the bowels going a couple times a day, two or three times a day. Um, and that may take a few days of adjusting the herbs just right. Um, after meals or at night to get the bowel movements proper. Uh, then, then a fiber can be added uh, to the diet slowly, and this fiber can be uh, formulated different for different people. Uh, for those who are dry, you want to use a little more oily uh, substances like ground flax. Those people who are uh, uh, heavier in weight and have uh, more oily constitution, like a kapha, can do more psyllium husk. And there's many variations of apple pectin, psyllium husk, and flax seeds, and triphala, and uh, marshmallow root, and other herbs that can be combined to make a, a fiber formula. And this fiber formula can be taken with uh, each meal uh, throughout the day to uh, bulken up the stools. And uh, this, in effect, has a cleaning and a drawing property as you're having these uh, larger bowel movements throughout the day. Um, and then taking the uh, laxative herbs at night to keep the whole thing going. So those are the three main steps, a little preparation with sometimes oilation, then purge, and then uh, laxative herbs to keep the bowels going, uh, adjusted for the person, and then adding in um, the uh, fiber to bulken up the stools. So this combination of large stools is, is cleansing out the colon slowly, and the herbs are continuing to push it through and uh, helping to tonify the mucosa in the uh, GI tract. And over anywhere from one week to two weeks, this can continue eating healthy meals, uh, full meals with very little snacking, uh, can, can cleanse out the colon uh, very effectively 
without much discomfort and allow the person to continue to go about uh, their daily life. Kabir, what a wealth of information as as usual. Um, uh, so, so what if, for example, uh, people aren't guided, and and is there a very basic uh, substance or herbs, and uh, or people who might not want to take herbs? Uh, would you suggest things like uh, colonics? Would you su- suggest things like enemas? You have the enema bag <laughs> sitting behind yes, we you. Have, we have the enema bag here, so we're very clear uh, there. <laughs> yeah, enemas are a very effective way to uh, clean the colon, and this would be uh, the next uh, therapy. And sometimes it can be used initially uh, when you do the enema, how often you do the enema, and what herbs and what you put in the enema bag are the real questions. Uh, Enemas are uh, a whole science in Ayurveda called basti, where you learn which herbs to put in the enema for different types of uh, conditions and states of the colon and different uh, doshas. So so water by itself is generally not used in Ayurveda uh, in cleansing the colon as is done here in colon hydrotherapy. I I think colon hydrotherapy can be very effective, uh, particularly those who are heavy, overweight, um, and have a lot of accumulation, more than likely, of fecal matter in the colon, and um, they, they, it can help um, and be effective. But it's not suitable for everybody. It can be very depleting. Um, it can actually aggravate constipation in some people. It can flush out all the intestinal flora in the colon, um, and then it has to be replaced again. So there's limitations to colon hydrotherapy, and it's not suitable for everybody. But enemas can be adjusted for everybody. And um, and even, I always advocate that you should uh, begin to educate your children in uh, experiencing an enema at an early age so they're prepared in case they have a fever or extreme constipation, they're familiar with the process, and you can avoid a lot of hospital visits by having an enema bag. And in fact, my understanding is that even in the West, uh, many doctors in the last uh, two, well, two, let's say two centuries ago or uh, 100 years ago, carried enema bags, and it was used quite extensively. And, and in other countries, uh, enemas are still used on a regular basis. And some countries, uh, even in hospitals, are doing colon hydrotherapy for uh, a majority of their patients before any type of treatment. So this is nothing new, using water and herbs to cleanse out the colon. This is a very ancient uh, practice, and uh, using an enema and putting in herbs like triphala or or licorice or marshmallow root or even just putting in oil uh, gives you a lot of uh, flexibility. Uh, in using uh, an enema to uh, cleanse out your colon. So this, in addition to the herbs, in addition to the fiber, um, can be very, very effective in cleansing out the colon over a slow period of time, not uh, not quickly. And and if a person is to do the enemas, I mean, uh, is it always done with herbs? Yeah, uh, at least use the salt. This is a at least, uh, say, for two quarts of water, at least one teaspoon of uh, Himalayan sea salt dissolved in warm water. And uh, enema should always be warm, should at least have salt in it, because the salt will help the water to absorb into the wall of the colon and uh, not uh, dehydrate it. Because if you, if you just flush it out with water, then it, you can dehydrate the colon. But adding salt helps the colon to absorb the water, and this is what we want. Uh, We don't want to dry uh, a colon. So salt is usually essential in really all enemas, and this is one of the restrictions that colon hydrotherapists have, and I'm friends with many colon hydrotherapists and do uh, support their work, but they're limited because they can't add salt uh, to the water because it would be harmful to their machines uh, that pump it. Uh, and then second uh, is adding oil. person who's very dry, particularly the vata type, they do very well with adding even a, a quarter cup of oil uh, to the enema 
so this is, is very comforting. And people who have done enemas in the past with just water, once they start adding salt and oil, they find it much more uh, uh, comfortable and less depleting, which is very important. But the main herb you could add to an enema bag would be a trifla. And trifla uh, also would be an herb you can take all year round. It's not, it's a combination of three fruits, tri, fala, tr three fruits. Um, and it's not a laxative or a purgative. It's a colon toner. So it helps the intestinal villi in the small intestines to become uh, clean. It helps the colon to absorb water and helps break up fecal matter in the colon. So you can take trifla all year round which is what I really recommend for uh, most of my uh, patients, even after uh, detoxification, is to remain taking some amount of trifla all year round. And it can be taken in much larger doses um, during uh, a cleanse. Of course, in Ayurveda, there's always variations. Trifla can be taken in oil, can be taken in ghee, can be taken in honey. Uh, so again, uh, the carrier and the actual method of uh, uh, taking the triflo would depend on the individual. Mm, thank you. Oh, okay. On our road to cleansing. <laughs> uh, did, did we cover the colon there? So think of, think of cleansing the colon out slowly for a few weeks. Um, the other thing that really will help anybody with any detoxification is their diet. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't mention that, but that would be part of the preliminary or our pre cleanse requirements is to clean up the diet. The objectives here are to remove the hard to digest foods to take the burden away from the digestive system. So this would mean, of course, removing uh, all animal protein, really, uh, except maybe a little yogurt, maybe a little ghee. Um, even if it was uh, part of the person's diet, it can be eliminated for uh, this period of time um, and eliminating other hard to digest proteins and nuts, even beans and uh, eating more easy-to-digest uh, uh, carbohydrates like rice and uh, cooked, cooked vegetables over raw. Raw is more difficult to digest. So in Ayurveda, the, uh, the main dish, we should say, that is provided through a detoxification program is a kitchari. And kitchari is made of white basmati rice, not brown, because the white is easier to digest, and cooked, steamed, somewhat starchy, vegetables with mild seasonings, cumin, coriander, sea salt. And this is uh, prepared and given every day, uh, the same meal, two, three, or four times a day, depending on the person's constitution and body weight. And this is called a mono diet. And a mono diet is very, very effective for stabilizing digestion. And uh, you can, it's going to be a high fiber diet. It's going to be easy to digest. And it's going to be pretty tasty with the spices. So um, but it is the same meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, hopefully at the same time. And this will strengthen the digestion within a matter of days and uh, improve bowel movement within a, a matter of days. And, um, and then the person would be ready for the detoxification, uh, uh, process. And during the whole process, if they can, they should remain on this mono diet of kitchari. But if not, at least modify the diet to uh, the degree which it will be easy for the person to digest. And of course, it tends to be a light diet, but high fiber. Kabir, we <clears throat> talk about uh, detoxification and detoxification takes a certain amount of energy. Uh, mm. The body has to maintain its energy and its sources of energy. Uh, also, I'm interested in what your suggestions are in terms of things to take to, for energy for the cells. Also, to look at antioxidants when we're producing many of these, um, when we're detoxifying in the body, we produce actually sometimes the liver produces free radicals, which require antioxidants. And I want to talk to you about that. And I also want to get your opinion on uh, digestive enzymes. I know you mentioned herbs, but we look at pancreatic digestive enzymes and probiotics that people are talking about quite a bit now when we're taking enemas and, and laxatives and things like that to cleanse the colon. There are also, as in everything, there's the yin and yang and everything. So when you're cleansing the colon, you're removing flora. 
What are your thoughts on probiotics and uh, antioxidants and digestive enzymes? Well, yeah, those quite a quite a few questions there. Uh, and of course, <laughs> uh, Ayurveda, Ayurveda doesn't look at things too much at a molecular structure, and uh, I'm not uh, that versed in understanding the body at a molecular level. But you are correct in that um, there has to be um, the uh, support of the body to deal with the this level of detoxification taking place, and that's why it's it's really very healthy to detox for maybe a week or two at the most, and then. Uh, stop the uh, laxatives and the, uh, the um, excessive elimination through the eliminating organs and re-nourish the body. And this would include uh, uh, taking uh, probiotics if necessary. Now, I believe that uh, with uh, enemas um, that, uh, that are prepared right or are not too harsh, that uh, you would not flush the uh, healthy intestinal flora uh, from the the colon, but of course, if a person was already deficient in these due to taking antibiotics or even excessive uh, uh, herbs uh, that could kill this uh, intestinal flora or any antifungal uh, product that could could have uh, affected your your balance, then this would be the time to replenish it kind of after your your colon cleanse. And as far as digestive enzymes, of course, Ayurveda doesn't advocate uh, replacement therapy, uh, which taking digestive enzymes or these enzymes made by the pancreas, as you mentioned, um, can be helpful. And uh, I do use them and provide them for people with serious digestive complaints. And you just want to help to help them digest before they're able to modify their diet. But generally, I only recommend one bottle of digestive enzymes um, and not recommend that people continue to take them uh, for a lifetime. Bernard Jensen, who of course had a big influence on me and has really wrote one of the best books or writings on a healthy colon cleanse in the West from a naturopathic point of view, uh, did say in his later years that he um, became addicted to a digestive enzymes by taking them with each meal. And Ayurveda does say that once the body has a, a, a replacement therapy like this, then the body itself can stop to uh, produce uh, this uh, uh, enzymes or hormone in the case of hormone replacement. So I think they can be used short term, uh, but I don't advocate uh, them to be used on a long uh, term uh, basis. And certainly, I, w I would assume that you would agree that when people start to take uh, antioxidants or pancreatic enzymes or probiotics, there's lots of marketing out there that, just like kids' cereals, that you know the marketing is not necessarily as good as the product itself. So uh, the suggestion would be that if you are going to take a pancreatic enzyme or a fiber or a uh, antioxidant or a probiotic that you really do your research uh, probably on many of the shows that we've done with Tracy Harrison and also with Kabir uh, you can look at getting the best products that you can not just go out and say well I had some yogurt today so I've taken care of my uh, probiotic it's very important to take uh, really good quality uh, supplements as you go through this process, because, uh, you know, when we look at it and we step back and we look, we're talks about being intoxicated and trying to detoxify. And those are very important processes. And we want to do the best we can for the purposes, again, of optimal health. So yes, when, go ahead. Many of these synthetic vitamins that people are taking are just what they say. They're synthetic, isolated uh, chemicals. And they may have the immediate uh, effect of overcoming a particular deficiency. Uh, but uh, at the same time, this can become a big burden for the uh, liver and the detoxification, uh, detoxifying organs. So synthetic vitamins um, should be removed uh, during this cleanse. And you're right that you have to have a quality products. But back to the uh, um, intestinal flora or uh, taking probiotics, um, there are a lot of misunderstandings in this area. 
Of course, people forget that these healthy intestinal flora are living in the colon, not the entire GI tract, and it's only when they're uh, overgrown with unhealthy intestinal flora or candida, uh, for example, that they come up the GI tract and we start to see the yellow film in the back of the mouth and, and, um, and other signs, um, and then they get deeper into the system in the blood and we can see other signs in the skin. But naturally, these healthy bacteria are, should remain, for the most part, in the colon. And if you have healthy intestinal bacteria, there's no need to take um, probiotics on a daily and continual basis. Uh, for example, I could take a handful of probiotics and not notice any difference the next day because I have healthy intestinal flora in my body, you know, and never having, having antibiotics or doing anything to uh, harm them. So even after uh, enemas, I'm probably fine. But a person who's already deficient in this area of having not healthy intestinal flora, when they take those probiotics, they will notice an immediate difference. And that's one way to know whether you need them. If you take them and you feel an improvement in your bowels um, and you see a lighter, fluffier stool, this is the higher concentration of bacteria because, in fact, a good third of our stool should be uh, bacteria. And the uh, uh, result of uh, bacteria breaking down your fecal matter in your uh, large intestines uh, creates a fluffy stool. So if you have a hard, dense stool that's by no means fluffy um, and you have constipation, these would be clear signs that you don't have a good intestinal uh, flora in your colon to help uh, to, to break down this fecal matter uh, in the final stages. Uh, so, but once you have it, um, it, it's quite robust and it will remain there. And when, one reason people um, have an overgrowth of the unhealthy intestinal flora or candida is often due to poor liver function and, and poor bile, which is one of the body's natural means to uh, keep this unhealthy uh, bacteria from coming up the GI tract. So uh, many people who have candida actually have uh, liver problems and gallbladder problems uh, because this is a natural uh, uh, defense against uh, unhealthy intestinal flora in the GI tract. Kabir, we only have about five minutes left, and I know that we're going to want to get your health tip at the end, but I wanted to ask you... Uh, if there's anything you want to get out as a message, not in terms of the proper ways to do the IR, to do the detoxification, but is there anything out there where you want to warn people uh, about improper ways of doing things before we get to your final health tip? Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, we covered a few of those and and not doing canned uh uh, cleansing packages that are fixed in their products or fixed in their length of time and adjusting it for yourself. I think this is the, the best advice. Um, and not forgetting uh, and focusing on the, um, the organs one at a time. We covered quite thoroughly the, the colon here today, and maybe in another session we could cover the detoxification of the liver, which is mostly used, uh, mostly herbal formulas and some uh, juicing is used for the liver, and then flushing the bladder and the kidney pathway, which again, uh, herbs and some fasting uh, is used in this sense. Uh, so maybe we could cover those in the future, but I would say my recommendation is that people uh, uh, listen to their body, not a book or the internet, and uh, when they feel it's time to detox, that's the time. When they feel that they've had enough of that laxative or cleansing out the colon, then this is the time to stop. Um, and, um, and then take a break, uh, eat your normal diet again. Or if you have to add in more proteins or animal protein, then that's the time to do it or get back on your supplements and then go into another round of detoxification. The second one being the liver, maybe the third one being the kidneys and the, then maybe the lymphatic system. And then finally, maybe you want to fast for a few days and, uh, uh, round out your whole a detox program, which can really last uh, even up to a couple months. Excellent. I think uh, 
we need to have more discussions on this because we need to talk a little more about fasting and the heavy metals. I'm not necessarily in favor of uh, fasting totally, uh, and I know that you're not either, uh, at least to some degree, because we need to have something in the intestines to move the toxins out once we're detoxifying things. So great talk today. What's your health tip? My health tip is uh, my usual health tip, uh, eat right, (laughs) keep the digestion going. Uh, because, uh, you know, poor digestion is creating this uh, type of, uh, uh, con- conge- congestion and, uh, toxins in your own system. And it's probably one of uh, the most, uh, toxic habits we have is this irregular eating, eating late at night, um, and, uh, which results in, uh, poor digestion, undigested food and uh, toxins in the body. So uh, once again, I think that's my usual health tip is to uh, focus on your digestion and to make sure you're not producing more toxins yourself. (laughs) To wrap it all up, it's like eat well and poop well. (laughs) You said it, Christina. (laughs) I like that. I'm very grateful to our special guest, Kabir Southwick, for uh, coming back and sharing with us his wisdom and experience, as always. I would like to thank all of my teachers and all of my healers that have helped me in my process and allowing me to be where I am at this point. I look forward to getting together again on Magical Medical Tour with all of our viewers as we explore another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy with Christina and Segovia and the, and the Yoga Hub team. So until our next meeting, uh, thank you so much, Kabir, and thank I you wish you all me. optimal health. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Glenn Woolman, and of course to you, our wonderful Kabir Southwick, for another session of incredible knowledge here. And uh, we all need to go out and start that cleansing. It's spring. And it's spring. It's spring, spring cleaning. So, of course, we'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We are grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. You can connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman by following him on Twitter, at Glenn Woolman, and of course through his own website, glennwoolman.com, where I definitely, definitely encourage you to learn about his metaphor square breath. You can also connect with our special guest, Kabir Southwick, at naturalhealingwest.com naturalhealingwest.com or come visit him here in Southern California in beautiful Santa Barbara by the coast or up in the magnificent mountains of Ojai. Remember, Natural Healing West. And again, we thank you for joining us today and we are grateful for any feedback. Um, Please uh, scroll down on your screen or make a comment or just give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK 818-LET'S-TALK Until next time. Namaste.